it's bright and loud. And scary. But if you watch lightning from space, you can learn a lot about storms. Like how soon the really bad winds are coming. Or hail. Or tornadoes. You see, people are building this new satellite. It'll be like a superhero with magic vision, watching out for us all the time from high above the Earth. It'll take hundreds of pictures of the cloud tops every second to find lightning flashes, even ones that don't hit the ground. And if a whole bunch of lightning starts all at once, well, then the weather people will know that bad stuff is just about to happen and they'll be able to give us more time to get ready and go to a safe place. Pretty cool, huh? Sure, it's bright and loud, but it doesn't have to be scary. Deep within their roiling clouds, thunderstorms hold an elusive surprise. Under just the right conditions, they produce some of the highest energy radiation naturally found on Earth, terrestrial gamma ray flashes. In a thunderstorm, collisions among rain and snow cause different parts of the cloud to develop positive and negative electrical charges. When the strength of the electric field overcomes the insulating properties of air in the thundercloud, a lightning flash occurs. Most lightning occurs entirely within the cloud and is called an intra-cloud flash. All lightning produces a strong and sudden change in the storm's electric field, but the upward portion of an intra-cloud flash sometimes sends a surge of electrons rushing toward the upper part of the storm. We do know the ingredients that are necessary to come together in order to form the storms that spawn tornadoes. In particular, there are three ingredients that we need. First of all, we need a very unstable air mass. Also, we need wind shear, so we need a lot of turning of wind with height in the atmosphere. And then thirdly, we need some sort of trigger, or some sort of impetus to get these storms started. Since I was a kid, I've always been interested in storms. As an engineer, I try to understand how things work. So I actually built and designed a device to measure the weather, basically, on the inside of a tornado. The United States, on average, gets about 1,200 tornadoes per year. And the reason is, is because of its unique geographic location. You got the Gulf of Mexico off to the south, and these storm systems, as they pass through, draw this gulf moisture as water vapor. It comes right up through the Midwest. And springtime generally reflects a very, what we call a very active jet stream. And it, and it brings this uh, very powerful winds uh, that just comes right across the Midwest. That in combination allows these big storm systems to develop. And of course, wind shear is a very powerful ingredient for tornadoes. The ingredients for a tornado obviously are quite complex, but some of the basics are, you know, you have to have moisture, you have to have lift, and then the most, other most important ingredient is what they call wind shear. And shear creates these big horizontal rolls in the atmosphere. And then when a thunderstorm forms underneath it, it actually tips these, these horizontal rolls in the vertical position to where a thunderstorm forms over them, you have the whole thunderstorm rotating. 
those final processes are what we're trying to study. You know, what's bringing the rotation finally all the way to the ground? And that's really one of the biggest mysteries of tornado formation. You know, it's very difficult to forecast where a tornado is going to be. When we're actually in the field waiting for thunderstorms to develop, we use what they call visible satellite imagery. This is basically a picture from space uh, showing the best areas, what we call instability. And that's how and where we are able to target these storms that are developing. Ground-based radar can't even see these storms develop, but satellite can. Satellites also detect what we call boundaries. These boundaries left over from old thunderstorms become the focus of new thunderstorms during the day and actually enhance the tornado potential. Visible satellite technology allows us to identify this which otherwise would be going totally unnoticed and undetected. One of the biggest things that I would love to see in future uh, satellite technology is the ability to actually see lightning uh, within the cloud tops. All the vertical motion and so forth greatly enhances its ability to create lightning. This lightning mapping will actually show frequency. If the storm is becoming severe, the lightning frequency increases and thus be able to do an early detection of whether or not that storm is severe or not. If we knew more about tornado genesis and structure, and we're able to stretch that warning out to 20 or 25 minutes. Right now, the average time is about 15 minutes or so. That gives people more time to prepare and seek shelter. Without the GOES satellite, we would be back in the dark ages of so the mid to early 60s. These GOES satellites are responsible, in my opinion, for saving many, many thousands of lives. Dark Lightning, presented by Science at NASA. NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope was launched in 2008 on a mission to study high energy phenomena in our universe. The telescope routinely detects things like flares, powered by black holes in distant galaxies, or outbursts from massive stars going supernova. So, in 2010, researchers were not surprised when the telescope was hit by a beam of high energy positrons the antimatter equivalent of electrons. That's the sort of thing Fermi is out there looking for. But they were surprised when they realized where the antimatter came from, not from some black hole light years across the galaxy, but rather from our own planet. The source was a thunderstorm just 3,000 miles away. Earth's magnetic field seems to have corralled about 100 trillion positrons from the storm into a tight beam and funneled them all the way to the spacecraft, explains lightning expert Joseph Dwyer of the Florida Institute of Technology. Something was producing antimatter above the clouds of Earth and hurling it into space at nearly the speed of light. But what? Dwyer and collaborators at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center and the University of Alabama believe they have figured it out. The answer, says Dwyer, is dark lightning. Dark lightning may sound like an oxymoron, but there is growing evidence that it is real. Ordinary lightning happens when electric fields build up inside thunderclouds. Electrons rush from one part of the cloud to another to try to cancel out the growing voltage. The flash of light we see traces the path of the charged particles, which heat the air five times hotter than the sun. If Dwyer's ideas are correct, dark lightning is a competitor of ordinary lightning. It also tries to cancel out the thunderstorm's electric fields. The process, he says, goes something like this. Under the right conditions, electric fields in a thunderstorm can create a powerful avalanche of electrons, shooting upwards nearly as fast as light. The electrons collide with air molecules, in turn producing gamma rays. Earth-orbiting spacecraft have been observing gamma ray flashes from thunderstorms since at least the mid-1990s. Next, the gamma ray energy transforms into a pair of particles, an electron and a positron. Successive collisions between these particles and other air molecules create a new batch of positrons and electrons. 
and the cycle repeats. A continuous feedback loop forms, like nuclear fission. It's a natural, self-generated, self-sustained particle accelerator, says Dwyer. Once the feedback loop gets started, he says, it can discharge parts of a thundercloud as fast as lightning. And, because the cascading electrons and positrons generate more gamma rays than visible light, the whole process is practically invisible to the human eye. Researchers once thought that gamma ray flashes from thunderstorms were a weird byproduct of ordinary lightning. Now they are thinking it is a sign of dark lightning instead. The gamma ray burst monitor on board Fermi is excellent at catching these flashes. At the American Geophysical Union meeting last month, Valerie Connaughton of the University of Alabama in Huntsville explained how new data processing techniques have improved the burst monitor's performance even more. In mid-2010, we began testing a mode which allows us to locate many faint gamma-ray flashes we had been missing, she said. Now, team members estimate, Fermi should be able to catch almost 1,000 flashes a year. With data like that, researchers hope to shed new light on dark lightning and solve its mysteries once and for all. For more news about dark and mysterious things in the skies of Earth, visit science.nasa.gov.